I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jelly's always the uh, difficult one. All right. All right. Okay, go for it. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today in our first Get to Know Your Professors talk of the semester. Um, first, I wanted to thank our professors for taking the time out of their schedules to join us for this opportunity. The beginning of the semester is pretty chaotic for all, so it means a lot to have them join us and uh, help benefit our students. Today, we are talking with the wonderful Dr. Coho, which also serves as our stages advisor. So we will all get to the chance to get to know Dr. Coho really well this year. He was also instrumental in organizing this series, so I wanted to thank him again for all of his help and support. Uh, for those of you that are new to Sages or just joining us for the first time today, I wanted to take a minute to introduce myself and allow our officers to also do the same um, and talk a little bit about Sages. Sages is a student association of geography and environmental studies. We are a group of students on campus that are passionate about our environment and anything related to our earth. We have several events planned for this year, including this Meet the Professor semester long series, volunteer work and community engagement, guest speakers, hikes, a camping trip, trip excuse me, among other events. My name is Christine and I'll be serving as your stages president for this school year. I'm a senior and I'm majoring in environmental studies and minoring in geology. My goal is to serve our students within stages to give opportunities that can benefit all members while we have fun doing it. All of our volunteer work and community engagement benefits not only the, not only the organizations or causes we work with, but also our students as it can be used in scholarship applications, grad school applications, and apply to CVs and resumes. I'll let our amazing officers take a minute to introduce themselves. This is really a group effort. So I was gonna start with Angeli. Angeli, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everybody, I'm Angeli Richard. I recently graduated from San Bernardino in 2021, spring of 2021, and now I am a grad student in the social science and globalization program. So if any of you guys need any help like preparing for grad school or wanna know more about the program or any other master's program on campus, I am here for you guys. You could DM me on group me and we could figure out a meeting time. Also, actually all of the officers are a model UN. So if you guys are interested in participating or learning more, um, you can also DM me or any of the officers for more information and we'll be more than happy to share that with you. All right, I am gonna go on to Sophia. Hello everyone, my name is Sophia Alvarez. Um, I am a senior this year. Um, I'm an IST major, but I am really interested in GIS. And also I love learning about the environment and everything that goes with it. Um, so thank you guys all so much for joining in today and hopefully I'll be able to meet many more of you in future um, stages meetings. Thank you, Sophia. And then last but not least, we have JP, he's our treasurer. I hope I don't still sound like a robot. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. <laughs> All right, uh, I tried to get to a place where I can turn on my camera. Hello everyone, my name is JP. I'm a fourth year global studies and environmental studies dual major. Uh, I'm just recently became treasurer because I wanna steal your money. So <laughs> no, I'm really excited to be able to help uh, contribute to all of your resumes, to all of your goals and, you know, individual interest in the environment. I, we're all just a bunch of hippies with green thumbs. So anything that I can do to be a service to you, I've worn about just every hat I could on campus. I know all the ins and outs. And I know for a lot of you, this is your first time either being on campus in person or just your, you know, your first year in general and you're trying to get to know people. And so this is a good place to be for that. You're gonna find some excellent people, some amazing community and some wonderful opportunities. So if you have any questions, don't be afraid to reach out. All right, it's a pleasure meeting you all uh, and I hope to see you in person soon. Awesome, thank you JP and thank you Sophia and Jelly. Um, with all that said, we'll now start our talk. Today we have Dr. Kahout, which teaches many courses within our geography and environmental studies department. I don't want to spoil too much of his speech, so I'll just let him take over and let him introduce himself and tell us what he does and all that good stuff. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Sages. I really appreciate this opportunity to get to know our students. Um, and I hope to see many of you in person over the course of the year. And uh, hopefully you'll find some of what I do interesting enough to stop by and chat or uh, we can do project together or take some of my classes. 
So I'm gonna share a screen so you can see some pictures and also it's a good way to market some of my, my uh, activities. Um, all right, here we go. All right, so I came to Cal State San Bernardino in uh, 2003 as a US-Mexico border specialist. And you can see the before and uh, during picture. So that was me in 2003, and this is me now, just in case <laughs> you, so you can recognize me. Uh, can everybody see the screen okay? Is like the whole screen on? Okay, all right, great. All right, so, okay, why isn't it going forward? Um, now it's not advancing for some reason. Ah, here we go. Okay, so this is, uh, I, I, I don't usually talk much about myself, but I thought, well, I might as well introduce my family as well. So this is uh, uh, my wife, Anne, who actually teaches, Anne Bennett, she actually teaches part-time in the anthropology department. So any of you may have, some of you may have courses or may take courses from her. Uh, she teaches linguistic and, Mid and peoples of the Middle East classes in the anthro department. Uh, we actually met here at CSUSB when I came here in 2003, and uh, and then uh, our son Charlie's 14, and he's going to uh, he's a sophomore in high school. All right. Well, I, I was actually born uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia in Pilsen, um, which is now the in what is now the Czech Republic. That's my elementary school behind me there, where I went to grades one and two. And, uh, and I actually do speak fluent Czech still. So, uh, so that, and that, that serves me well, and I'll tell you why in a second. But uh, the other thing I want to tell you is this is where I fell in love with geography because my grandma, when I was a little boy, my grandma bought me an atlas. And uh, I remember going through the atlas and reading about all the countries and looking at the maps and, and thinking, wow, this is a wonderful thing to do. And I was really intrigued. And then I also collected stamps. And so that was another window into the world. My dream was to always travel and see different places around the world. So this was this is kind of my formative time when I was a little kid in, uh, in Czechoslovakia. Uh, in getting into geography in that very, very kind of uh, basic way of looking at maps and looking at different countries and studying what they do. So why is it, why is it good that I still, that I speak Czech? It's because I have a study abroad program in the Czech Republic. So, so uh, a couple of summers ago before COVID, we did our first ever study abroad to the Czech Republic and see my students there on the, on the left uh, attending a hockey game. Uh, and then on the right is the cathedral in my hometown, uh, it's, which is the tallest, has the tallest spire in all of the Czech Republic. And this summer, you can see my cool sages shirt there, which maybe we'll get, we'll get those again, get those going again. Uh, so this summer, actually, the study abroad program in the Czech Republic will be between May 28th and June 11th. So if you're interested, uh, reach out. Talk to me and uh, I will tell you the program and I will tell you which courses you can take as part of that study abroad program. Uh, and on the right, if you know, if if you're lucky, like my students were, you can even meet my grandma. <laughs> so that's my grandma there in Prague and my students, we kind of were walking around my during a day off and my students happened to be walking by us. So they got to meet my grandma. So, uh, so, so this is this has been great for me because it's uh, you know I, I have a lot of relatives in the Czech Republic and I'm very familiar with the place, so it's a really great time to take students uh, there to Europe. All right, and then when I was 10 years old, my uh, family immigrated to Canada, and I grew up in London, Ontario. Um, and London, Ontario, which actually has a Thames River, just like London, England. Uh, the, the interesting thing about London, Ontario, that is kind of a fact is that uh, it's the most representative city in Canada, meaning that its demography, its population characteristics are actually mimic those of Canada as a whole. 
uh, the most, the, clo the closest. And so it tends to be a place where a lot of companies do market survey research, market studies, for example, for products because of that fact, right? It's like a little microcosm of all of Canada. Uh, let me admit somebody, Christina. So I grew up in, uh, in Canada and then uh, this is where I got my first, my BA degree, my honors BA in um, Western Ontario University, which used to be the University of Western Ontario. This is a kind of a running theme in my life. I was born in Czechoslovakia, but now that's the Czech Republic. I went to the University of Western Ontario, but now it's Western. So it's like these name changes for some reason are following me around. Um, and what I did in, uh, what I did for my thesis, my BA thesis was I looked at um, industrial location on the US-Mexico border, which is economic geography. Essentially, what I was interested in is why does Mexico have these factories on the U.S.-Mexico border, right on the right up against the border? Um, and intuitively, of course, the idea is that because the American companies are taking advantage of lower labor costs in Mexico, but actually, the one of the primary reasons why they're there is because of proximity. In other words, distance from the U.S. market is actually a greater uh, a draw to uh, build those factories on the U.S.-Mexico border uh, than, uh, than the relative, uh, relative low cost of, of labor in Mexico compared to the United States. So this is the first time I ever went to the U.S.-Mexico border as part of this, uh, doing this thesis. Um, and, I, and basically, I, I kind of fell in love with the place. Uh, it's, it's, it, to me, it's a very dramatic place, uh, very, uh, you know, very out of the way place. I don't know how many of you have been to the border or kind of traveled on the border, but it's a really fascinating place, but also a, a pretty, um, you know, it's not very charismatic, let's say, <laughs> particularly the cities on the border, but still a fascinating place. So with that, I wanted to keep going. And uh, uh, so I moved to, uh, I moved to Texas and I did my master's in geography at Texas State University, San Marcos, which used to be Southwest Texas State University. So again, it's a three for three in name changes. So I hope they don't rename Cal State San Bernardino because that would be too much. But uh, so I, uh, I did a thesis there. Uh, my master's thesis was on uh, unions in the Mexican border factories. And what I was trying to figure out is why is it that some Mexican border towns have very strong union movements in the factories and some much weaker ones? Um, and essentially, it's about history and tradition. Uh, so the kind of the varied landscape, if you will, of unions uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border is uh, mostly because of the his history of these cities and the tradition of labor organizing in those places. So that, that was, that was I, at this point, I was living close to the border and I get to go there quite often. I, I even volunteered, spent time volunteering for a, a Mexican labor organization on the Mexican side of the border where I uh, made friends that I still have to this day among the organizers there um, and, um, and got a kind of a real uh, chance to uh, to travel in Mexico, uh, learn Spanish a little bit better. Um, and then finally, um, I moved to Massachusetts um, and I did my PhD at Clark University, which was not my first choice. I wanted to stay on the border. I wanted to go to ASU, Arizona State University, but they didn't want me, so. That's their loss. So. They didn't want me. So I had I went to Clark University instead, which is way up in Massachusetts. And my PhD dissertation was on new labor politics and economic development in Mexico. So what I was curious about is, it's kind of like a mix between cultural and economic geography. What I was interested in is, how Mexico's economic development was impacted by this re reimagining or rethinking of how uh, how workers would fit into this kind of a new development idea 
that the Mexican government was trying to implement in the country. And essentially, you know, what I found out is that, for, and this is something I share with students in many of my classes, but what I found out is that, uh, that the new labor politics essentially meant that workers uh, would unfortunately be uh, kind of sacrificed uh, at the altar of uh, prosperity for very few people in Mexico, uh, particularly the wealthy and the powerful. And so it was a very, it was, it was a very sad experience in that way because sometimes when you do research, you're exposed to a lot of sadness and uh, suffering. Um, and you know that's that's something that kind of stayed with me because it was you, know, you could see how these workers who were working very hard were really struggling to get by. And that despite their uh, efforts to organize, they were constantly being undermined by their own government and even by their own union organizations, which were selling them out to the government, so or into business. So it was, it was a bit sad, but on the other hand, I got to live in Mexico City for well over a year. And yes, I speak Spanish fluently as well. So, and that serves me well as well because uh, I run a study abroad program to Mexico. <laughs> this summer. So usually, uh, usually, and it's worked out really well for me, I run two study abroad programs every summer, one to Mexico uh, and one to the Czech Republic. Um, and, um, and during the, the summer before COVID hit, actually I had one or two hardcore students who went on both. Can't believe they did that, but they did. And uh, so, so the Mexico uh, study abroad is going to be a little bit, um, a little bit later than the Czech one. So the Czech one is going to come up first, right after the semester, spring semester, and then the Mexico one is going to be a little bit later. But um, let's see. So here are the dates, and we go. We usually spend time in Mexico City, where I lived. So I have a lot of contacts and a lot of places I know. And then San Luis Potosi, which is kind of a new place for me, but where we've established some really interesting connections. Um, and you can see, for example, on the right here is a really great field trip we do, which is to a, uh, a mezcal making hacienda. So I don't know if anybody knows what mezcal is. Mezcal is like a like a, a, a alcohol that's made from agave plants, but it's not tequila. It's different agave, so it makes different different liquor or different booze, which is mezcal. And uh, we go to uh, one of these very large haciendas, which are remnants from the Spanish colonial times, which have been repurposed to make uh, mezcal, to distill mezcal. So it's a really fascinating kind of experience. Um, but so if you want to go to Mexico between June 25th and July 10th, that's, uh, that's when the trip is going to be. Again, same thing. Just please reach out and I'll be more than happy to, uh, more than happy to talk to you about that as well. All right. Um, after Mexico City, I lived in Naples, Italy for a year and a half. Uh, and I do speak Italian, but not as fluently as uh, Spanish or Czech. Um, and the, probably the reason for that is because I haven't had a chance to have, do a study abroad program in Italy. So <laughs> I don't know if I could do three programs a year, though. I think I'd go crazy. But uh, but I, but I I would love to return to Naples with students. I think it's one of the most fascinating cities in Europe. But it's, it's the most densest populated place in Europe, actually. And it's ancient. It's a, you know, it's a city that, uh, uh, that is, uh, yeah, extremely old. So, um, and of course, what's fascinating about Naples is that it sits right under uh, the Vesuvius, right? This is where Pompeii is. And so there's this fantastic uh, environmental hazard right there that, uh, uh, that they have to worry about as well. So, and of course, the other fascinating thing about Naples is that it's the birthplace of pizza. So if you like pizza, you've, you'll never have a better pizza than you'll have in Naples, Italy. So, and you have to go there. You can't have Neapolitan pizza outside of Naples. It's impossible to replicate. So you actually have to go to Naples to have the original and the best pizza. 
So we'll we'll see. Maybe eventually I'll I'll try to maybe maybe one thing I was thinking about is eventually maybe combining the Czech Republic with Italy and making a little bit of a longer study abroad program. That's something on my radar, and I would love to do that because I think uh, it's a fascinating uh, comparison, and it's a fascinating both are fascinating places. So hopefully soon. All right, and then I came to Cal State San Bernardino. So after all of that, uh, here I am, and these are the courses that I teach. And I tried to put some description. I don't wanna necessarily read, uh, but I'll tell you that, for example, uh, last year for the first time, I taught the cultural geography class, which is I'm very excited about, uh, which uh, for example, you know, one of the things we talked about was how we choose to adapt to our natural environment, right? So this idea that that cultural choice has become kind of the primary way that we adapt to our natural environment. In other words, we you know, make decisions based on values, traditions, and ideas that we have about the environment to then relate to it, right? So we explore a little bit of that. Uh, I like teaching, I often uh, teach urban geography which I think is very important for our region because um, what I tried to do in that class is get students to research their own cities where they live so they understand why their cities look like the way they look like, who is in charge in their cities, how they can impact uh, the, the way their cities function, for example, and what they look like as well. So I tried to uh, get students to become interested in the cities where they live so that they understand how they may be uh, made better um, or how they may be uh, changed um, to accommodate everyone as opposed to, you know, very specific uh, groups of people. Uh, and this, this semester I'm teaching political geography. Um, and uh, this is the first time I've taught the course. Uh, Professor Gershom, who moved up to uh, to the dean's office, uh, left this course, and so I, I picked it up, and I'm enjoy. We're enjoying learning uh, about, for example, elections. So we have big elections today, right, in California. So we this is something we're already talking about in class about um, you know how different places uh, create. Uh, election processes and whether or not they're democratic, for example, or how democratic they are. So for example, we're gonna cover in classes how election outcomes in the United States depends on how we draw uh, voting districts. And you know, this is called gerrymandering. Some of you have maybe heard that term, where essentially, as they say, the, the saying goes that, that politicians pick their voters as opposed to voters picking their politicians, right? So we learn about things like that. Uh, then uh, I teach the, well, the original course that I was, that I created when I first got here was the U.S.-Mexico border region, which is kind of an, a human geography overview of the border. So we look at immigration, we look at economic geography with the border plants that I researched before, the border factories. We looked at, we look at the border economy and its impact on border cities. We look at I already talked about immigration. We look at uh, the border culture, for example, which is this amazing hybrid of of European, uh, well, of of uh, of Western European and uh, Mexican culture. So, uh, and we used to we used to take field trips to the border uh, as part of this class. However, because of security concerns on the Mexican side of the border, unfortunately, we can't go across. But we used to be able to go across. I take students to uh, Mexican, to Tijuana specifically, and also to Tecate. Um, but unfortunately, we don't we don't do that nowadays. What we do usually is we go to the border, to the U.S. side of the border, and we do a ride along with the U.S. Border Patrol, which is a really fascinating perspective on the border. Um, right, the kind of the security militarization of the border perspective that we do. So uh, I, I believe this course is gonna be offered in the spring, next spring, so 2022. So that will be part of, certainly a uh, field trip will be part of this class as well. All right, and then I teach a class on advanced world regions, which, which is usually I focus on Europe uh, because of my background. 
Uh, also, this semester, I'm teaching migration and borderlands online, unfortunately, but uh, uh, we're looking at global migration patterns in that class. Um, so basically, I have this wide assortment of human geography classes that I teach. I also teach sometimes uh, there's other courses that I, sh I mean, a lot of these courses I share with other people. And so sometimes I end up teaching uh, a regional course in Latin America. Sometimes I teach a class in economic geography as well. All right. Yeah, and so one of the things I love to do, just like everybody, uh, most of our faculty members, all of our faculty members in the department, we get out in the field because that's you know what geographers do. Um, and like I said, you know, uh, the border field trip has always been a uh, uh, one that I do often. But I've also done field trips to, for example, downtown LA. I've done a field trip to uh, the steel plant in Fontana. They used to be Kaiser Steel. Um, and so th these are really exciting uh, moments that I get to share with students in the field. And it's, a, it's really exciting and it's really great to teach and learn geography in the field, right? It's kind of almost the ideal way to do it, certainly. So, uh, and speaking of field trips, of course, uh, and this is Sages, uh, we've put together, we're putting together right now, uh, Sage's field trip to the Salton Sea from November 12th to the 14th. So um, this, I'm very excited about this. Actually, uh, it's, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be not just Sage's, but also students from art and English are gonna join us on this field trip. I'm planning it with colleagues in art and English. So it should be really exciting um, to the Salton Sea. So I'm sure Sage's will tell We'll have a lot of uh, information about that and a lot of time to advertise this as well. All right, so finally, uh, what am I working on in terms of research um, lately? So right now I'm, I'm starting a new project, which I, called, uh, which I call tentatively Remaking the Inland Empire. And what I'm interested in is how community organizations are remaking and re reimagining our region. Um, and this is kind of building on previous research that I've done uh, in, in the area on what I call, what's called suburbanization. Suburbanization is kind of like urban geography where uh, it's a specific type of way of thinking about cities and how cities are, um, how cities are built, how cities are built and perceived and lived in. Um, and uh, immigration politics. Uh, so I've done a little bit of research on immigration politics in the region as well. Um, particularly during the time when there was a lot of backlash against immigrants in the early 2000s in the region. And then finally, a little bit uh, also combines a little bit of regional planning, which is this idea in California that uh, has always resurfaced that we should plan regionally, but in the end always dies. Uh, because in California, unfortunately, uh, so-called home rule is the, is the most dominant kind of logic of planning, which is home rule means that, you know, that every city does its own planning and the level of cooperation between cities is very limited. So this is a project that I'm interested in. So those of you who are active in community organizations, those of you who have connections in community organizations, I'd love to hear from you. Love to get information about uh, about your what you know, what's going on out there in your neck of the woods. Um, uh, so this is something that I'm just beginning now. And the other little project that I'm working on, just kind of out of intellectual curiosity, is what I call geographies of nationalism in North America. And what I'm doing is comparing the geograph the the, the explicitly geographical notions of nationalism. Uh, between Canada, so I don't know if you know this, but Canada dubs itself the true north. Not sure what that means, really, but I'm looking to find out. <laughs> the true north as opposed to just the north or a north, but so it's the true north. It's in the anthem, by the way, true north, strong and free, uh, which I know, of course, because I'm Canadian and American and Czech, so. Uh, then, of course, in the United States, the very famous frontier myth and the manifest destiny, which is this idea that uh, that the continent was meant to be settled by Americans. Right? 
as they pushed from east across to the west. And then in Mexico, uh, something called Mexico Profundo. And Mexico Profundo is, 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 those of you who speak Spanish, means deep Mexico. And deep Mexico is this notion that uh, essentially the real Mexico is the central part of the, and the south, southern part of the country where the bulk of the indigenous populations are. And the north is kind of like this Americanized uh, bastard child, right? So uh, that's just to give you an idea of uh, some of the things that uh, I've been thinking about. So uh, that's, that's all I have for this point. Uh, if you're uh, if you have any questions or you're curious about anything that I've just talked about, please feel free to, to ask. And I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to get this chance to, to share all this with you. So thanks. Thank you. Um, I actually had a question. You were supposed to originally teach the geography of California and things got mixed around. Do you know if you'll be doing that in the near future? Because I was interested in that class. Um, <laughs> That's right too. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I yeah. I mean, I like to teach it, of course. Yeah. I think yeah. we decided that we decided that uh, we were going to offer the border class instead this spring, but hopefully, maybe next year. Um, I hope I'll get to teach uh, because I like. Yeah, that's one of the classes that's been shared uh, in our department. Uh, Professor Goforth taught it. Uh, I believe Professor Meek has taught it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, not sure who else besides the three of us has taught it, but, uh, but, uh, you know, we decide as a department how we schedule courses. So in essence, I think we, we, uh, we have, so we've kind of decided that we're going, I think we've, we decided, uh, Professor Goforth can answer this. We decided that we're going to do the border in the spring and then, but go ahead, Professor Goforth. Yeah, we're going to be working on our next two year schedule of course offerings. Um, so that's uh, kind of how these uh, course offerings are planned is that we have that sort of long term planning. That way, when you make your MyCap plan, you can pick a class that's actually going to be offered. So that's coming up. Keep your eyes uh, peeled for that, and it will be posted on our department webpage and also in your uh, My Coyote uh, schedule. Awesome. Thank you guys for answering that one. Any other questions or comments or? I'm excited to go to the Salton Sea. That's for sure. I'm excited for yeah. that. Capital. Same here. I've always low-key been very obsessed with it. I don't know what it is. I think just the environmental nightmare it's becoming. And I think I'm going to try to find some sort of way of maybe doing my master's like around it or something. I don't know, but I've always been like low key obsessed with it. So I'm excited to do. Well, you're very lucky because Cal State San Bernardino has fantastic resources about the Sultan Sea, including the Sultan Sea Archive, which is at PDC actually. So it's right, right next, right where you go uh, to for your classes, Desiree. So. You can have access. It's a, some of, a lot of the stuff is digital, digital, digitalized, I believe, digitized. Sorry, um, but uh, the rest of it is on the PDC campus, and you can make an appointment to look at it. Uh, I plan to go look at it actually before we go on our trip. Uh, I've never had a chance to look at it, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. But but just to let you know, bef uh, before we go on the trip. I'm gonna to put together, or we're gonna to put together kind of like a packet of resources for all the students. So you have a good chance to look at a bunch of stuff about the Sultan Sea before we even set eyes on it. So yeah, so that you have some kind of background uh, reading and background viewing as well, because there's some really great documentaries and uh, about, the, about the Sultan Sea as well. So we'll put all that together for you guys, okay? Awesome, thank you. I'm muted. I keep talking, forgetting I'm muted. Um, I was just curious, when you lived in Mexico, did you get the chance to see the pyramids? Yes, uh, so part of our study abroad, yes I did, and as part of our study abroad trip, uh, I don't know if you noticed on the, one of the pictures, there was the Pyramid of the Sun in uh, Teotihuacan. So what we're going to do is we get to do both Teotihuacan and uh, Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan, of course, is the center of Mexico City now. 
And one of my contacts is one of the lead architects in excavating uh, Tenochtitlan or downtown, underneath the downtown of Mexico City. So she gives us kind of like an insider look. Last time we got to go underneath uh, a historical building, colonial building in downtown Mexico City to see a tower of skulls that the Aztecs constructed. They essentially, they, they took the skulls from all the people they sacrificed and created like a, like a pyramid out of it. And we got to see, they were excavating this and we got to see that nobody else got a chance. To, it's not even open to the public. It's just a, the, arche, the uh, archeologists who are working that now. So, so yeah, so, uh, you know, if you go on study abroad to Mexico, you get to see, you get to see both Tenochtitlan and Teotihuacan and, and we go to Xochimilco, which of course were the floating gardens, the Chinampas, yeah. right? Well, so-called floating gardens, they're actually tethered by uh, roots to the, to the, to the uh, floor of the, of the lake. But so we get to go there as well, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, I had a question. Let me meet myself. Go ahead, Amanda. I think, Amanda, you had a question. Okay, cool. Um, I am actually graduating this fall, so I was wondering if the field trips that are offered in spring would be open to alumni, or are they only available for current students who'd be attending in spring? All right, that, yeah, that's a good question. So we've had several alumni go on the trips. What they do is they enroll Ooh, it's a good question. I don't remember. I'll, I'll find out for you though. Okay, I will. If, if you if you uh, if you could send me an email just to remind me, I, I will look it up for you. But essentially, if I remember correctly, the alumni enrolled for one credit. So, like a lot of these field trips, a lot of these uh, study abroad programs, they're they're made uh, for anywhere from one to six units, I believe. And so, if you just if you're if you just um, enroll for one unit through either, I think, because they're already, they all run through the College of Continue, uh, from what's it called? The College of Continuing Education, I think. So in that case, um, you can go, yeah, totally. But I can look, I can look at, I can look into more specifics, exactly how you would do it. If you could send me um, an email and I'll put it in the chat. So there you go. So just send me an email to remind me. I'll look it up for you and send you send an email back. Okay. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I want to ask a question about the study abroad programs. I am very much interested in those, and um, I guess I'll probably have to email you. But how um, do students cover it, like financially? Okay. That. That's another good question. So both of the programs are relatively inexpensive because both the Czech Republic and Mexico are actually quite very, very affordable. Like most students fly uh, to Mexico from Tijuana, which is very, uh, then makes it very cheap. However, there are, there are subsidies from both the president's office and now also the Dean uh, of Social Behavioral Science. So you're gonna get a thousand dollars. $500 from the president, $500 from our dean. Although I have to confirm that with to see if the dean is still offering the $500 because this is what this was before COVID. I'm pretty sure the presidential uh, scholarship is still in effect, but I'll confirm to make sure that the deans, because uh, the dean was matching it. So you get a thousand bucks right off the top. So that's awesome. And then the Czech Republic is the most expensive thing about the Czech Republic is the plane ticket because we stay in dorms and, and the Czech Republic is very inexpensive compared to the rest of Europe, like uh, particularly Western Europe, like uh, it's basically half price of Germany or maybe somehow less. So, so once, you know, once you get there, it's pretty inexpensive and the thousand dollars that you get would cover probably your plane ticket. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Yeah, yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll confirm that the dean is still offering the $500 scholarships as well. Right. 
Cool. Thank you. I was wondering how long are these um, are the study abroad programs? Yeah, so uh, essentially uh, about two weeks, more or less, yeah, about two weeks. I The Mexico program used to be a little bit longer, but uh, because I'm doing two, uh, I kind of needed to shorten them up. And we also figured that uh, in terms of budget, it's a bit easier to do uh, on, on students to do just a two week program as opposed to a longer program. Uh, you know, Cal State, Cal State as a system, and even Cal State San Bernardino offer a huge variety of study abroad programs of different lengths. Uh, but um, I feel like two weeks is kind of the, the although, you know, in, in the future, we'll see. But I mean, this for these study abroad programs coming up right now, yeah, it's about, it's about two weeks. Awesome, thank you. Did anyone else wanna ask a question while we're kind of coming up on our time? <laughs> yes, I did. Awesome. So Dr. Kahau, um, is that how you say, how do you say your last name, first of all? Kahou. Kahou, okay. Um, so is it mainly just visiting the places for the study abroad or are you taking classes or is it open to everyone? Uh, I'm just, I was just posting the dates for Mexico on the, on the thing. I'll post the Czech Republic on the chat. Um, yeah, so you are taking classes. Yeah, you're taking anywhere from one to six units and there's a whole list of classes you can choose from. So if you need some, usually I found, or at least, you know, through experience, we found that students, um, they, first of all, you need a certain amount of units to get financial aid. So you have to take a, you know, minimum amount of units for financial aid for these summer classes sometimes. And I'm not sure what that minimum is at this point. It used to be, it used to be six units under the quarter system, but now under the semester system, I'm not sure. Um, and then, uh, the other thing was, uh, that, you know, certain students were interested in, um, like I said, you know, a certain amount of units, they wanted more or less. And so I tailor every class depending on how many units people need. And then in terms of the assignments you do, you do either less or more depending on how many units you need and the different types of assignments as well. So yes, it's a class, a full on class. The, the one in uh, the Czech Republic has to do with uh, with a kind of like urbanization mostly, mostly you know, studying the cities, but also uh, Europe, kind of like contemporary European issues. And then one in Mexico is called Contemporary Mexico, and it's quite comp comprehensive. I mean, we look at a lot of, you know, politics, the economy, culture, uh, the environment. So there's a lot of, uh, and essentially it's all field field based. So, you know, we do spend some time together in like a classroom setting where we discuss things, our readings, and, and we discuss what we're gonna go look at. But then the rest of it is, is in the field, right? So we're basically in the field every day, uh, going to different sites, whether it's community gardens or historical sites or, or you know, significant cultural sites. Um, we go visit migrant, we, we, we visit a migrant shelter in San Luis Potosí which is on the route from Central America through Mexico to the United States border. And, and this is where the, I don't know if you heard of the train La Bestia, the, the beast, which is the train that migrants jump on top of to get a ride across Mexico uh, to, uh, to the border. Well, the Bestia, the beast stops in San Luis Potosí. It's one of the main stops. So you could actually see the migrants on the train waiting for the train and we go there and we do volunteer work there for a day. We we put together like uh, care packages for migrants. And uh, so we do that in San Luis Potosí, for example, it's one of the big highlights that students love to do. Because of course, many of our students are intimately knowledgeable about immigration since their own families or they themselves are immigrants. So yeah, so this, yeah, full classes and, and the units are flexible and so are the class offerings as well. And uh, all of that's gonna be coming up really soon. The information's coming out soon. 
through uh, through um, um, through study abroad. But I, but I can provide you any information you need as well. Wow, that's so interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> Well, I think we're at our, we're a few minutes over our 12.53, we're supposed to be 12.50. Um, and I know some of you guys have classes and whatnot um, to go to, um, but I wanted to take the moment to thank everyone that attended today. This was great, but also Dr. Okay, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna try to say this right. I know I've asked you like three times now, how to say your name, Dr. Uh, how? Yeah, go home. Go home. Okay, thank you. I always say it wrong. Like every time I butcher it. I'm so sorry. It's all right. It's all right. It's not easy. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kohout, for your time and that awesome presentation. Um, this was great. I'm really happy that we were able to share this with everyone. And I learned a lot that you don't normally get to learn about your professors when you're, you know, doing your normal assignment stuff. So this is pretty cool. Thank you. By the way, I noticed that uh Michaela, is it Michaela? I'm sorry, Michaela. She says Dr. K. I, I never had anybody call me Dr. K before, but I'm 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 okay with that. If you're having a hard time pronouncing my last name. <laughs> that works. I've taken to that practice with some professors in the past. I'm like, I don't want to disrespect them by butchering the name. So I'll just do the initials. <laughs> Well, thank you guys again. Um, I think we'll probably call this the end. Um, and we've got another Meet the Professor Thursday. I believe it's with Dr. Alford Thursday, right, Anjali? Yes. And then I believe Dr. Goforth is next week, I believe. Um, and then we've got a few other professors coming up. Um, I'll try to keep up on the social media and emails to remind everybody, because I know there's so much going on that it's easy to you know kind of forget. Um, but again, we appreciate everyone's participation and showing up and, you know, this is the first of many. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. It was nice seeing all your lovely faces and lovely names <laughs> in Zoom. So everyone have a good day and see you guys soon. Bye, you guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.